And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Menachem Blondheim, who will chair our next session. A Jerusalem history vignette, uh, when, as I was growing up, many of us, uh, nothing was ever scheduled between two and four, to use a prejudiced uh, expression, both uh, prejudiced nationally and biologically. Two to four were the hours of uh, mad dogs and Englishmen. Decent people held the Schlafstunde between two and four. So uh, <coughs> luckily, we're after four. Everyone should be quite alert. And in any event, I'm sure our panel and our topic uh, will be uh, real eye-openers, uh, figuratively uh, as well as literally. Uh, this, what I heard so far, this is quite a fascinating uh, conference, uh, intriguing, revealing. However, uh, I find it extremely depressing. Uh, I think anti-Semitism prejudice, hate, are uh, the worst aspects, possibly, of uh, humankind's performance. And here we are dwelling on this. Uh, in a sense, this present session has a, a redeeming uh, aspect that makes it less focused on this deep, dark, horrible continent uh, of human uh, hatred, hatred and prejudice. We will not be foc focusing necessarily on the nasty messages uh, that have anti-Semitic or other prejudicial content. We will also be looking at the media that convey these messages and, in a sense, in many interesting ways, uh, shape the message, uh, constrain it, condition it in many ways. In fact, our interesting complex panel uh, we'll be looking in many ways across media, keeping the anti-Semitic message constant. What will be changing is time and media. And uh, in this cause, we will first be looking with David Mark at television, both old television, newer television. And actually, David will be starting before television, uh, looking at radio and other media that gradually developed to carry various kinds of messages on uh, ethnic interracial stereotypes. Uh, with Alan Rosenthal and Hillel Treister, uh, we'll be looking at changing ways uh, that visual and uh, cinematic technologies can encode in uh, new, different ways uh, these kinds of messages. And then uh, with Sarah Grosswald and Mike Dahan, uh, we will be looking at new ways of packaging, conveying, transmitting uh, hate messages via uh, the new technologies. Uh, I did want, I did prepare some opening remarks on uh, the issues to be discussed here, but since we're so short of time, I will skip them for this time. I doubt if our speakers will leave me time for like a summary. So I'll just start off, David, as we decided with uh, anecdote or an experience I had uh, on a recent sabbatical for the United States with my family. Uh, we were going down to the Smithsonian. We lived in this upper middle class neighborhood uh, in the vicinity of Washington and North Capitol was closed and we had to travel through uh, 17th, 16th Street, these uh, very poor slums populated more than 90 percent by Afro-Americans. The trip to the Smithsonian was much more remarkable to my children uh, than the visit at the Smithsonian itself, though the uh, Museum of American History is a wonderful one. Uh, it, it was a culture shock. They were sure that Afro-Americans were a kind of an American uh, elite, an American nobility, because all, they, all their experiences of black Americans were the upper middle class families, good friends on our block, and what they saw on television. They found it extremely unsettling to compare the reality they knew, which was television, was what, with what they thought they were seeing from the windows of our car in these very uh, run-down uh, neighborhoods populated by Afro-Americans. So television, in many ways, is the real world. 
uh, and it is very powerful in conveying images of groups, ethnicities, ideas about them, as we heard in the previous session. And uh, I hope David can enlighten us on uh, whence uh, this came from uh, and how it developed. Uh, a few words on uh, David Mark. It's his first visit, uh, surprisingly, it's his first visit uh, to Israel. Uh, he's a professor of communications at uh, the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse University and head of uh, the school's popular television, uh, Center for the Study of Popular Television. Uh, he is the author of numerous books uh, and essays. Probably the one most relevant to your presentation today, David, is Comic Vistas. Visions. Uh, comic uh, Visions. Other books are Prime Time, Prime Movers, uh, Bonfire of uh, Humanities, and uh, Demographic Vistas. That's where the Vistas is from. Uh, David also. Uh, received many prizes and distinctions, he was a Fulbright Fellow in Denmark, and he even delivered a brilliant lecture uh, at the Hebrew University on art as a form of communication. That was yesterday p.m. at my graduate seminar. <laughs> Before David starts, if I may, those who have cellular telephones that aren't shut off, David tells me uh, you get fines in New York for that. Here, you don't get fines, but courtesy would recommend that. Um, I, I think because of the uh, the sense of, of emergency, uh, uh, fine over here, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the sense of uh, emergency that I heard uh, in previous sessions, I, I should mention uh, coming here from uh, uh, the United States that um, at a peace rally um, on the Syracuse University campus, uh, the main subject of uh, most of the speakers uh, who opposed uh, a war in Iraq uh, was their concern for Israel that it would be uh, an excuse for uh, Saddam Hussein to unleash uh, the weapons of mass uh, destruction on the Israeli population. So the, um, the discourse isn't uh, uh, going in quite the same way as it is in, uh, in Europe. Uh, okay, so I was asked in this conference uh, concerning uh, anti-Semitism uh, to not speak about anti-Semitism, but uh, instead to speak about the uh, construction of um, ethnic stereotypes in uh, popular culture and television. After touring the United States in the 1930s, George Bernard Shaw told the BBC, there are three things which I shall never forget about the United States. The Rocky Mountains, Niagara Falls, and Amos and Andy. Assuming that uh, you've heard, the first, uh, heard of the first uh, two of these. Let me get right to the third. A Amos and Andy was a radio series, one of the first examples of what we would now call situation comedy. Uh, it premiered in 1929 on uh, NBC Radio. Uh, and it was arguably the single most popular broadcast series of the entire radio era in America. Uh, it played for 24 years on radio and then television and was consistently uh, within the top five shows uh, in the, uh, the ratings. The show was set in Harlem, and all of its characters were African Americans. However, its two stars, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell, who also created, produced, and wrote the show, were both white uh, Southerners, uh, as were all the other actors uh, whose voices were heard on the show. The show's main source of humor was the caricatured mispronunciation of words and misunderstanding of simple ideas and promotion of uh, stereotypes. Um, so I was asked to talk about ethnic stereotyping in American entertainment television, and I've started uh, by talking about radio, and in fact, I plan to go back even further. So let me begin this uh, short talk by stating a principle that I hope will give this presentation some coherence. When a new medium is seeking a popular audience. It always begins by adapting the proven popular content of an existing medium. Another way of stating this is to say that American popular culture is not so well understood by its academically famous media revolutions, uh, you know, 
look it up in a card catalog. It's the title of 50 books, uh, This Media Revolution, or, or that. These are brush sh uh, shifts from stage to screen to uh, radio, uh, uh, television, and so on. Uh, not media revolutions, but rather by continuities that can be found in distinctive lines of content evolution that cross and transcend media. I believe that American popular culture, which has been planned, tested, and executed by a shrinking handful of corporations, especially since the 1920s, is perhaps as unified a body of work as was ever produced by the patronage of a royal dynasty or by the appropriations of a ministry of culture. I might also mention that there is little support for this approach among my colleagues in the U.S., at least partially due to bureaucratic disciplinary divisions in the American Academy that encourage the study of individual media at the expense of integrated content study. Uh, excuse me, can I ask for my, my glass of water? Thank you. Okay, so let me uh, return to a phrase that I used um, a moment ago, distinctive lines of content evolution. One of those lines is the presentation of ethnic and racial stereotypes, which has been among the most commercially successful features of American popular culture since the latter half of the 19th century and continues to be so. Well, this may sound like an oversimplification designed to uh, fit the title of the talk. There are several indicators we can examine to give this assertion credibility. In working my way to television, I'd like to begin with a previously existing medium, the stage, and one of its popular genres, the minstrel show. The minstrel show is a genre of stage production that originated in the American South and eventually became a national phenomenon. It is solely devoted to the performance of patronizing and often degrading caricatures of African Americans, most of which originated during the slavery period. Uh, according to Robert Toll, uh, T-O-L-L, -L, his book Blacking Up is probably the uh, authoritative work on uh, the, the minstrel show. Uh, according to Toll, minstrelsy was the single most popular genre of American theater during the last 30 years of the 19th century in terms of attendance and in terms of influence on future popular entertainments. The performers in minstrel shows originally were all whites who painted their faces black and played a series of standard set characters all of whom reflected and personified racist articles of belief about the low intelligence, low ambition, and clownish personalities of African Americans. The critic Sherman Paul characterized minstrelsy as, quote, the tragedy of American slavery replayed as a comic musical romance to entertain the villains of that tragedy and their co-conspirators and admirers. By the turn of the 20th century, a rationalized transcontinental railroad system in North America was absorbing regional theater, uh, such as uh, the minstrel show, by creating national opportunities for white performers on what became known as the vaudeville circuit. These were traveling shows uh, which were cast by large corporate businesses, most of which were headquartered in New York and Chicago, and really you get the beginnings of the uh, kind of entertainment industrial complex uh, that you have today in the rationalization of popular entertainment. Uh, in, in vaudeville. Vaudeville absorbed many minstrel acts and performers, uh, but its lower middle class urban audiences also enjoyed laughing at ethnic stereotypes of their new neighbors, European immigrants, uh, especially those from Ireland and from Eastern and Southern Europe. Uh, A.B.'s Irish Rose uh, about a, um, uh, a, a Jewish husband and uh, his uh, Roman Catholic Irish wife uh, was a standard sketch that later on was made into a film and uh, uh, in the exhibition of posters uh, in the little gallery here, uh, you, you can see the poster uh, uh, for it. Uh, Chico Marx of the Marx Brothers developed his Italian uh, character on, on the vaudeville stage. Interestingly, African American entertainers, many of whom had begun their lives as the children of slaves or in some cases actually as slaves, inherited the old regional minstrel show which constituted their first opportunities to perform in front of paying white audiences. And they had to play the characters exactly as they were expected to. Many of these performers were well aware of the source of minstrel popularity and were extremely conflicted about the price and personal dignity that they had to pay in order to work on the stage as professional performers. Uh, let me leave the subject by recommending one more book um, 
Bert Williams, a biography of the pioneer black comedian by uh, Eric Smith. Uh, Williams was one of the um, uh, black minstrel performers who uh, was uh, very saddened by what he did for a living, yet uh, wanted to do it for a living. And he had an exchange of letters with the president of uh, an all-black college uh, at, at the time, at the turn of the century. Uh, was very instructive about um, uh, the position uh, that he found himself in. The popularity of race stereotypes on stage was strong enough to transcend medium. The first American feature-length film, a silent film, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, makes extravagant and socially explosive use of African-American stereotypes, including perhaps the most vicious racial archetype in all of Euro-American folklore the black male rapist stalking the innocent white female. Uh, in this case, uh, she commits suicide rather than uh, uh, submit, which uh, in the context of the film mitigates the, um, uh, the horror. The rapist in Birth of a Nation is a light-skinned mulatto, and this is Griffith taking advantage of the new visual medium to make the horror of the rape attempt doubly apparent to the audience. Griffith's offering view is not merely the monster attempting to violate the virtuous woman, but the monster attempting to beget yet another monster in so doing. Other scenes in Birth of a Nation are right off the minstrel stage, such as a scene that takes place before the American Civil War, in which a South Carolinian slaveholder shows his visiting cousin from Pennsylvania how happy the slaves are with their life on the plantation as the camera shows them singing and dancing and eating watermelon in the cotton fields during the middle of the workday. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, storyboard, um, uh, on the screen it says, uh, the slaves enjoy, and this is the exact word that's used, their break. Um, in another scene, recently freed slaves are shown serving as officials of the South Carolina State Legislature during the Reconstruction period. The legislators have their feet up on the desks. They're shown eating uh, fried chicken with their fingers at a session of the South Carolina uh, legislature. Birth of a Nation was, as President Woodrow Wilson described it, quote, like writing history with lightning. And of course, Wilson himself had been a professor of history at, uh, at Princeton. Oh, um, I'll dispute that later. Um, but, uh, Birth of a Nation was, in, in many ways, a classic minstrel show with white performers made up in blackface, blackface playing the featured African-American roles. It's worth noting that Griffith based Birth of a Nation on a 1905 novel, which also was adapted uh, into a stage play uh, titled The Klansman, A Romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon. The film, was, the film was originally titled The Klansman when it was released in 1915, but the title was changed after the film was previewed in San Bernardino, California, and was picketed by veterans and widows of veterans of the Northern Army. Uh, Dixon's novel expressed the Southern interpretation of the American Civil War, and Griffith, who was uh, a Southerner, became obsessed with the fact that that message, which he called the true story of the South, was being suppressed by the Northern Cultural and Publishing Establishment, uh, which either lambasted it or simply ignored any works that uh, ad, uh, advocated it. By using the experimental communications technology of the cinema, a medium thought too trivial to censor or too trivial to even provoke the interest of serious critics, Griffith bypassed the cultural establishment of New York and Boston and took his message directly to the mass audience. The analogy to modern day internet hate sites is, is obvious. Race was also the subject of the next great technological event in American cinema, the 1927 release by the Warner Brothers of the first commercial feature-length talking picture, The Jazz Singer. This time the focus was on the question of the assimilation of immigrant Jews into American culture. That task, as laid out by the film, does not require the conversion of the Jews to Christianity, but rather the conversion of the Jews to the new American religion of show business. Let me say just a few words about the jazz singer before moving into to broadcasting. Al Jolson, born uh, Asa Josephson in Shrednik, uh, Lithuania, was among America's most popular mammy singers, uh, which was another name for uh, minstrel singers. He'd been a member of Doc Statter's uh, Minstrels, one of the last surviving minstrel shows. And in vaudeville, he specialized in doing minstrel numbers. 
In the jazz singer, Jolson not only sings in blackface, but he appears in blackface for the key dramatic sequence in which he must choose between uh, singing Kol Nidre at his, father, at his father's synagogue uh, and making his debut on Broadway. His mother goes to the theater during dress rehearsal to try to convince him uh, to do the right thing. When she sees him in blackface, she explains, you look like my Jakey, are you his shadow? But this is not the most bizarre aspect of the film by any means. Of the hundreds, perhaps thousands, of American studio musicals, the jazz singer is perhaps the only one of the genre that has absolutely no resolution of its romantic subplot. The Jolson character, Jakey Rabinowitz, who changes his name to Jack Robin, is romantically involved with a non-Jewish woman, a ballet dancer, through most of the film. She simply disappears near the end of the film with no explanation. It was one thing to show a Jew, or for that matter, an Italian uh, or a Pole, assimilating into American culture while still loving his mother. This was heroic. It was quite another thing to portray what nativists called the mongrelization of the white race, uh, that meaning Northern Europeans, uh, in a comedy. And so it was simply dropped uh, from, from the film. The jazz singer has been remade three times and imitated in dozens of knockoffs. Uh, Birth of a Nation can still provoke a riot when shown on an American college campus, which is the only place it can be uh, uh, shown, if uh, it can be shown there. Um, but in popular culture, there's no greater validation than becoming the model of imitators. Birth of a Nation is a nasty, insidious work of art. The Jazz Singer is a musical soap opera that is flawed even by terms of its own genre, and it's one of the most popular films in American history. The same year that The Jazz Singer was released, 1927, excuse me, commercial network radio was introduced in the United States. Ethnic stereotypes quickly became a major feature of radio for at least two reasons. First of all, radio used vaudeville as a primary source of material, and it was a, uh, uh, a mainstay of vaudeville. But it was also true that because of the caricature of ethnic accents, uh, which had always been uh, popular in the U.S. Um, that was one thing, and it was quite literally made for radio. You, you listen to the uh, ethnic, ethnic accents. In addition to Amos and Andy, we have such hits on radio as The Rise of the Goldbergs, starring Gertrude Berg, about a Jewish family in New York, um, Life with Luigi, concerning Italians in Chicago, I Remember Mama, about Norwegians in San Francisco, and, and so on. Thomas Cripps, in his uh, article titled uh, Amos and Andy and the Debate over Racial Integration, uh, which appears in an, uh, an anthology called American History, American Television, uh, asserts that the radio program effectively taught tens of millions of urban immigrant Americans the most basic southern stereotypes about African Americans for some two decades. Uh, some critics have defended Amos and Andy by pointing out that, like most radio sitcoms, it was almost completely devoid of sexual content. And by denuding it of that um, foremost of uh, uh, stereotypes, uh, somehow uh, mitigated it. Uh, the only other radio series that had African-American characters in it was a show called Beulah concerning a maid and in this series, uh, a white man played the part of the lead female character, who he said uh, was an imitation of uh, the, the black nanny that had uh, uh, brought him up uh, in the South. Gosden and Carell had also played Amos and Andy in blackface in three Hollywood feature films. And they wanted to do the same when the show was made uh, into a television program in 1951. Uh, but William Paley and David Sarnoff, the heads of the two major networks at that time, both refused to consider the idea, and it was dropped. Ironically, the TV show, with its uh, black actors, the only opportunity on uh, early American television uh, for African-American actors, besides the TV version of Beulah, and she was played also by a black woman on uh, TV, uh, ironically, th these provoked a storm of criticism that had not surrounded the radio show. Most critics point to the fact that the civil, right, uh, civil rights organizations had grown considerably stronger after World War II as their ranks were filled by African-American war veterans. 
Uh, the NAACP led the fight against Amos and Andy, and under the threat of sponsor boycotts, CBS took the show off the air after only two seasons, despite its good ratings. It's one of the few uh, uh, shows with good ratings that was ever removed for another reason. Uh, black actors counter-protested, claiming that there would be no blacks at all on t TV if the show was canceled. And in fact, they turned out to be right. From 1953 to 1966, there was not a single show on American television, despite its boom and its expansion with the uh, success of the third network, uh, ABC, uh, was not a single show starring a, an African-American uh, performer. Uh, there was one other example of a show that was taken off because of um, prote protests by uh, ethnic and uh, religious groups, and that was a program called Bridget Loves Bernie uh, in the 1970s. It was a replay of uh, Abe's um, Irish Rose uh, with Bridget and Bernie, and it was the protests of Jewish and Roman Catholic groups about the portrayal of a positive inter-religious uh, marriage. Uh, which uh, both claim to be an attack against their religion that led the networks to um, uh, give in. Um, I'll just stop there. Okay. okay. <laughs> Websites of hate, overview, and update. Two words on uh, Sarah. Uh, she actually is a local. She works for the Sassoon uh, Center. And she's production editor of the uh, Felix Bozen Bibliographical Project. Uh, she's also, uh, the, uh, she does the ana analysis of current trends in anti Semitism series, which you can find outside uh, on the table. I don't know if I'm allowed to disclose this, but uh, Sarah also does consultants for uh, researchers in uh, anti-Semitism, bibliographical health, and so forth. And I will hear her if she is accessible. Uh, Um, I will begin this um, presentation with a, a short introduction and um, uh, in this introduction I would say that uh, whatever we will see here is uh, uh, completely different from whatever uh, you can uh, see in other uh, media or sciences. Um, a few weeks ago, the, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, companies in the internet, the AOL, um, uh, made a big loss to the Ted Turner uh, company, a, a hundred billion dollar uh, loss. And uh, this is important to us because that shows that whatever is working in real life and in the real economy, it's not working in the internet economy and it's not working in, the, um, in this arena as in uh, the real world. Um, there are um, a lot of uh, users at uh, the internet, this is about 600 million of uh, uh, users around the world, around 200 million in uh, the United States and 200 million in Europe, and most of them are uh, young people. Uh, these young people are very um, um, influenced by this media, and uh, whatever they see here and whatever uh, they um, get from the internet is very important uh, for their life. Um, 
this uh, influence is used by the, the hate uh, groups and uh, all kinds of other groups to uh, confirm some kinds of uh, um, uh, foreign ideas that they can have from uh, different, uh, different uh, places and also they can introduce new ideas also using the forums, the discussion forums, and also using the um, um, some kinds, sometimes also they are uh, giving um, um, emails um, to these people uh, on their subjects. Um, these uh, uh, technologies are uh, is what we are uh, going to see now. Um, some of them, uh, I will show also the contents, uh, also the, te the different uh, technologies that they use. Um, almost everybody now in uh, everywhere can be um, an internet user. Also everybody almost can put on uh, online a site. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, matter if it's a big um, commercial company offer it's only a one person sitting at his house and uh, doing the same thing. They are reaching the same kind of, uh, of uh, the same amount of uh, audience by doing, uh, it doesn't matter how much money do you have, you are reaching the same amount of uh, people. And this is important because it's uh, not the same as television that if you don't have uh, enough money you cannot uh, be there. Here, everybody can be there, and you are uh, influencing uh, the same amount of people anyway. Um, in these two uh, years, there are a, a big, um, the last two years, there is a, uh, a big uh, um, uh, growth in, uh, in uh, anti-Semit uh, sites, and some of them I'm going to show you now. Okay, this is the first one. You can see they use uh, also um, uh, Latin. This is, the lenda is Judaica, it says uh, delete or uh, destroy the Jews. And here, every, every part of this, of this site has a link to an article and every one of these is another link to another article. As you can see, this is a huge site, a, a, a huge site because every one of these is a link to other links. And you can see the, the, uh, the, the subjects. Jewish uh, occupied governments, Jewish organizations, Jewish uh, mechanism to destroy the white race, Jewish uh, reference and documents, financial, yes, all the Jewish politics, what we do to Christianity, etc. Uh, this is uh, uh, what you can find in one of these links. This is a, a book called The Poisonous Mushrooms. Of course, we are the poisonous uh, mushrooms, the Jews. And uh, this is a um, um, book for children uh, that was published in Germany in the 30s. And here you have every chapter online in full text. Uh, Okay, this is another uh, um, another site. You have here uh, Jewish hate groups, uh, Jewish communist rulers and killers, Jewish Zionist Soviet anti-American spies, and every one of these it's a link. That means that everyone is a document that have links to other documents. Uh, 
אני צריכה קול, אין לי קול. Politics and terrorism. Terrorism. Okay. Israeli oppression and subjugation of the Palestinians. This, uh, whatever uh, it says, is not so important. The thing is uh, that they use the, you know, uh, things that are very appealing to some uh, some special people, and this uh, um, uh, they use, of course, voice and image. And this is uh, Zionist uh, occupation uh, government and Jewish occupation government. These are the, the initials. And uh, this is uh, some uh, uh, special, uh, well, this is what happened. This is something that is interesting for us too because whatever you can find today, you can't find tomorrow. The, this, uh, this, um, Sites are changing every day. They are on and down uh, every day, uh, almost. Uh, this is another kind of site. Um, and it, how you can see it's very different for the other, from the other one. But the, the messages are almost the same. This is the World Church of the Creator. And you see here they put the, the Star of David what is not there, but this is Bush, that is, of course, behind, uh, we are behind him, the, the state of Israel is behind Bush, and whatever happened at the Twin Towers is because of the Mossad, and all, all, uh, uh, all is here. This is the big conspiracy that is, of course, uh, you can see here, but oh, they, they, are, they are the eyes, you know, the conspiracy. Here you can find um, the uh, Jew is destroying, the Jews are destroying the United States. And um, some here, some place down here, you can find the uh, the book of uh, um, Ford, the eternal Jew, the international Jew. Really? Okay, I will go on for uh, the Nazi sites. This is the, uh, by the um, this is in Spanish, this is uh, um, the Raua, this is the Russia, uh, Holy War. This is the British, the American National uh, um, Nazi Party. This is the Occidental Panarian Crusader. And here you have uh, almost every book that you can imagine on uh, uh, Hitler and everything in the, it's uh, Mein Kampf uh, online in full text. This is the British National Party, and I, I don't have sound.
Okay, here uh, you can see they, they are using also the the um, uh, the nine the the nine of uh, November as a, as a, um, as a symbol. That is the the is also the night of the crystal night, and it's also the night of the first putsch of uh, uh, um, Hitler, and it's also um, I don't know if it's. Uh, somehow related, but it's also 9-11, it's like 11-9, so <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> maybe it is. Um, this is the uh, Ku Klux Klan that uh, you will know. Uh, of course, they said that this is uh, Ku Klux Klan, and if you are not, uh, uh, oh, and this is very interesting, you can look for sex offender in your state, they, are, uh, they have a database. And uh, here are the Holocaust deniers. This is uh, a huge uh, site where you can, the, the main issue of this uh, uh, site is to show you that whatever is said about the concentration camps and the death camps is, uh, is not true. And they have uh, uh, pictures and explanations on, on each part of the camps and whatever they are, and of course that it couldn't be true. Um, this is another uh, Holocaust denier. This is uh, uh, Bradley Smith, um, David Irving. These ones, I, I just passed them. Uh, this is uh, his focal point. Uh, this is the Sundel site. Uh, Sundel is now in jail because uh, um, some kind of immigration uh, problem he had in the uh, United States, and his uh, wife uh, is uh, managing the, the site. This is another uh, Holocaust uh, denier. And here we come to the big white church, uh, white uh, uh, group, of uh, supremacists. This is the storm front. This is one of the first uh, sites online. Uh, this is the white power also. Uh, this is Tov uh, Shebegoi Marog, kill the best Gentiles, and this is what they said we, we say. Um, of course, they use the, uh, the Talmud to say uh, uh, what, uh, what we say about the Goim. Uh, and this is uh, a white man's radio. Uh, that I don't know. Okay. Okay, and now you can enter the radio and hear all the white radio for, uh, um, of course, uh, the appropriate uh, program. Um, I will go, I have only three minutes, so I will show uh, something very interesting. Um, and this is a program uh, that is called Husichu. And this is a database that you can enter a name and, and you can uh, know if he's a uh, Jew or not and in what position in the United States government or in media they have. And if you don't want to install this program, so you have it here online, the Jews in magazines and newspapers, the Jews in radio, and of course you open it and, and you, in media companies and you have uh, what are all the um, uh, um, groups that have Jews and what position they have and how they control, of course, uh, all America and uh, Europe. Um, another thing that I, 
I didn't reach, but uh, in the two that last years, we have a, a big growth of um, um, sites that are, of course, anti-Zionist, uh, or I call them anti-Zionist, and they are, um, I can see, um, um, like they are using this kind of uh, words like uh, Israeli Holocaust, or um, uh, Jewish authors underscore Israeli Holocaust against Palestinian, and they use the name of Israeli um, authors. That is uh, this this one. That is uh, Michael Hoffman and Moshe Lev Lieberman that wrote a book that is called uh, The Israeli Holocaust Against the Palestinians. And they is, of course, all the, all the web is just now um, very glad uh, of these two persons. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this striking presentation. Yes. And, uh, Interestingly, there's some parallels between these, some of these hate sites and Jewish sites. Yes, right. In the same thing. I'm sure in yes. the discussion there will be questions about yes. how popular these sites are, okay. how you estimate their overall uh, girth and so forth. And still within the land of internet, we will be turning to uh, Dr. Mike Bahan of the Edinburgh University, uh, who was one of the first political scientists Israel, in Israel and worldwide to really address the internet as a new uh, element shaping and uh, having uh, an impact on international relations and on the political process. Uh, Mike has published extensively on uh, these uh, interrelated topics and now he's moving, I understand, much closer to civic society and the internal, rather, the, the international effect. So how these two aspects will be seen in uh, internet, or it will be, of course, uh, very interesting. Uh, to be honest, it's it's actually rather strange for me to be giving this talk today. Uh, most of my uh, uh, academic career <coughs> has been devoted to understanding the positive and empowering effects of the internet for um, for progressive organizations that compose uh, civil society and for disadvantaged groups in society. <clears throat> As such, I've uh, focused on primarily left-wing groups, organizations and movements, as well as other groups that present uh, a, a positive message to the public. Um, I've also devoted a great deal of energy to using the web in order to advance cooperation and understanding among Arabs and Israelis. I do believe that the uh, architecture and unique characteristics of the Internet and computer-mediated communication can contribute to the achievement of what most of us would accept as positive goals. Yet in preparing this talk, I was forced to look into some of the deepest and darkest crevices of the Internet. One of the questions posed to me by, uh, by one of the judges of my doctoral dissertation a few years back was, why do you focus only on progressive groups in your dissertation? The question was perfectly justified. Indeed, hate groups are a part of civil society as well, together with peace and women's groups, ecological and health organizations, religious groups, anti-globalization movements, and anti-war movements. Hate groups are simply the flip side of the same coin of civil society. Uh, for those of you that are not sociologists, political scientists, civil society is that arena composed of voluntary organizations which in liberal democracies function with relative autonomy from the state and economic power. These groups, organizations, and social movements seek to influence policy and decision making and to spread their agendas among the public. The internet as such supports lateral institutions of society, forms of association among people that are based on shared interests and situations rather than on hierarchical authority or individual relationships to a, sense, to a center such as <coughs> the government or news media. I will now turn to a discussion on how the Internet is used to achieve these goals. 
Communication media may be distinguished by three possible ways in which to connect people. The first way of connecting people is one-to-one, -one, essentially face-to-face -face communication, meetings, facsimiles, telephones, all examples of one-to-one -one communication. The second type of communication is one-to-many, connecting one sending location with multiple receiving locations. <clears throat> Broadcast media such as radio, television, newspapers, talks like this are all forms of one-to-one -one <coughs> communication. Uh, one-to-many communication, thank you. Uh, Computer-mediated communication falls into the third category of many-to-many, -many, connecting multiple sending locations with multiple receiving locations. Many-to-many -many communication combined the personal and interactive quality of one-to-one -one media with the broadcast capability of one-to-many communication. Each party is a sender, a receiver, and a broadcaster. Computer networks thus greatly speed up the process of people-to-people -people interchanges of information, ideas, and plans of action at an extremely low cost. Hence, its contribution to the groups that comprise civil society, regardless of whether such groups are progressive, conservative, or in our case, groups that espouse hatred and anti-Semitism. Electronic mail distribution lists and websites provide a low-cost and timely way of distributing targeted information to members and other interested parties. The low cost of narrow casting and the perceived anonymity of the Internet are particularly appealing as a way of distributing and publicizing confidential or controversial information to a select audience. An online organizer for a white supremacist movement has commented that electronic communication, I'm quoting here, has had a pretty profound effect on a movement whose resources are limited. Tens of millions of people have access to our message if they wish. The access is anonymous and there is unlimited ability to communicate with others of a like mind. Turning now to a discussion of the modes and methods used by hate groups in order to disseminate uh, their message to the Internet, it's important to note that these modes are essentially the same <coughs> as those used by non-hate groups, with the interesting exception of some of the types of material distributed via the Internet by these groups. Essentially, in the case of uh, hate movements, hate groups, uh, computer, games, computer games and white power and neo-Nazi music. This is unique to the hate groups. Hate groups were early adopters of uh, computer media communication before the Internet became popular. As far back as the 80s, some of the veteran groups like Stormfront were using BBSs, which were essentially, essentially bulletin board services where people would dial in directly to a certain computer in order to download or upload information. Today there are hundreds if not thousands uh, uh, of such groups on the, uh, on the Internet and as well noted and documented uh, by Raymond Franklin's latest uh, hate report on the Internet which was published last, uh, last month. It's a hundred pages long. There's no commentary. It's just a list of websites and discussion groups. The Internet offers a powerful tool for, communi for communicating and coordinating action. <clears throat> it is inexpensive to use, increasingly pervasive, with an estimated 600 million users today. <clears throat> Groups of any size, from two to a million, can reach each other and use the net to promote any agenda. Their members and followers can come from anywhere in the world, and the information distributed knows no boundaries. There are essentially five modes of use of the Internet by civil society groups collection, publication and distribution, dialogue, coordination of action, and finally direct lobbying of decision makers. Hate groups on the internet make extensive use of all these modes, but particularly the first four, collection, publication and distribution, dialogue, and coordination of action. I'd like to discuss the characteristics now of each of these modes. In terms of collection, uh, one way of viewing the Internet is, uh, is, is a vast digital library. <clears throat> the web alone offers billions of pages of information, much of which is free. Hate groups may and do use this mode in order to identify other groups and individuals receptive to their messages, gather contact information for potential supporters and collaborators. They may also search for news reports, which they see as being supportive of their particular worldview. <laughs> There are many tools that aid in the collection of information, tools that all of us use every day. Search engines, email, distribution lists, chat, and discussion groups. In some cases, the net allows these groups to avoid censorship. This is particularly relevant to groups that exist in countries that restrict hate speech, uh, uh, like Europe. Uh, such groups can host their websites in the U.S. in order to bypass legal restrictions. 
often these sites have training guides with tips on how to make use of the Internet in, in disseminating hatred. In terms of publication and distribution, the Internet offers several channels whereby hate groups and individuals can publish and distribute information and disinformation to further their objectives. They can send this through email and post it to news groups. They can and do create their own electronic publications or contribute articles and essays to those of others. They can and do put up websites that serve as a gathering place and a source of information for supporters, potential supporters, and onlookers. A new addition to the technological tool bag is that of peer-to-peer -peer networking, uh, familiar maybe to some of the younger people in the audience here, uh, known also as Napster and Kaza, it's essentially programs that allow one to connect directly to another computer on the internet and download files. In this case, uh, white supremacist music is, uh, is widely available from among other users. Okay? This system also provides a system of decentralization. There is no central website to turn to. Okay? You can distribute these files uh, among other people's computers. People connect directly to these computers via the Internet as a, as, as a mediator and download the files. Uh, in that sense, it's impossible to close down or to try and censor any of these materials. It's worth noting here that the existence of these groups on the web has contributed significantly to the study of them as well as the efforts to combat them. In the words of David Goldman, uh, who directed uh, a small organization called Hate Watch, which was absorbed within the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center uh, a couple of years back, the Internet is the greatest thing to happen to hate. It's also the worst thing. One of the reasons that the Internet is popular among hate groups is its cost advantage that I mentioned earlier. It's cheaper and easier to post a message to a public forum or to put up a website than it is to operate a television, radio station, or print a newspaper. Distribution is global. They also have full control over the content of the sites. Many of the sites now are making use of video and uh, audio streaming technologies, uh, essentially turning these sites into radio stations, as we saw before, or TV stations uh, with lectures or sermons uh, uh, by activists. Another reason these groups make use of the Internet is the perceived sense of uh, anonymity that uh, both the person or the group that sets up the website uh, feels. Again, this anonymity is, is perceived because a lot of these people can be traced, websites can be blocked. The characteristics of the website of the web also allow for a more focused appeal. Many of these groups target three key audiences, children, teenagers, and women. The children and teens are enticed with computer games uh, that underscore the message of hate and frequently allow players to kill Jews, blacks, and uh, other individuals. One of the more advanced games allows players to manage a concentration camp. The distribution of white supremacist music is targeted to teenagers, while women are presented with issues related to family values and the purity of the race. By using the net for publication and distribution, Implementers no longer have to send out magazine books or, vid or videos in brown paper packages to anonymous post office boxes. They can provide entire multimedia. Uh, they can provide an entire multimedia package, readily downloadable, saving considerably on distribution costs. Users no longer have to fear what their neighbors might say if they see them receiving such packages. In terms of dialogue. The Internet offers uh, uh, several venues for dialogue and discourse. These include email, news groups, web fora, chat, and various instant messaging tools. Discussions can be confined to closed groups, for example, through email or password-protected fora, or it may be open to the public. Hate groups make use of all these tools and often hold virtual online meetings with their supporters. While in the past, these meetings may have taken place in private homes, Today, these take place online, opening up membership beyond that of a defined geographical border. Dialogue also offers a, all, <clears throat> dialogue also offers a potential for the creation of support groups uh, for those facing difficulties or ostracism due to their anti-Semitic uh, views. Thus, like-minded individuals can meet and provide support for one another, as is often the case with online communities. They no longer feel that they are alone in their views. In this sense, discussion groups and online communities are much more effective in spreading hate on the web or on the Internet than, uh, than websites are. The degree of interactivity in these communities is extremely high. They provide a sense of focus and belonging for their members and serve to offset the alienation that some of these people may feel. 
In this sense, the creation of community is more effective than static websites. And while these sites may be an initial entry point into the web of hate, this is augmented through the discussion and dialogue that takes place via email. In this sense, email is a more effective tool than the web. David Goldman, again from uh, Hate Watch, notes that extremists need to be told that what they do is good and right and true. These interactive discussion groups, even more than the web, let them feel hope, like they're participating in a community larger than themselves. These venues allow a safe exploration of extremist ideology, one in which no physical commitment is made. For people who are members, discussion groups have been likened to a virtual cross-burning, a kind of hate fest in which participants reinforce one another's racist views. They also allow for the ever, for the ever more important individual and unconnected, unconnected activist, the so-called lone wolf, to take part in movement debates and even planning actions without exposing himself. himself. There is evidence that these uh, organizations actually encourage the lone wolf phenomena, which allows the organization and the individual to distance themselves from one another. That is, it provides them with a sense of plausible denial. Um, going over some of the key points in discussion, um, I just want to try and focus on, 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 uh, on the point that uh, email and these uh, 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 online communities are often uh, uh, more effective in spreading hate. Uh, the first is privacy, okay, as opposed to a website. Um, while some of the lists are open, most of them are closed uh, to people from the outside. They're either password uh, protected uh, um, <clears throat> or limited. People simply don't know of their existence. Mm -hmm. For hate groups like the Neo-Confederate League of the South, South, which poses as a mainstream conservative outfit, this is important. It allows members and even leaders to speak candidly. Okay? The leaders have a tendency to speak more openly inside of, these, uh, inside of these forums than they would in the press or on a website. Persuasion. Discussion groups allow activists to talk personally to potential members who are alienated but not yet uh, convinced racists. Uh, anonymity for sympathizers. It reduces the perceived risk of contacting these groups. Uh, notes Todd Schroer, a professor at the University of Southern Indiana. If you go to a Klan rally or actually write to one of these groups to get involved in hate, that's a big barrier to overcome. Through public discussion groups, persons who may be interested in joining can discuss, can discuss it thoroughly before committing themselves. Planning. Groups like Hammer Skin Nation. Which, put on, uh, uh, which puts on several white power music concerts a year, have had consistent trouble uh, with being shut down by anti-racist um, activists. And this way they can do their coordination and their planning quietly without being, uh, without being bothered. Support, and this is particularly important. While it's not safe to publicly brag about, say, beating up Jews or blacks or gays, there are some people who applaud these actions and even some women who flock to those who carry them out. Discussion groups essentially provide uh, a, a very warm and loving uh, uh, um, atmosphere uh, for people involved in these hate groups. In terms of uh, coordination of uh, action, um, hate groups make great use of the web in coordinating action among members and with other organizations and individuals. Mm -hmm. Action plans can be distributed by email or posted on websites. Again, services are cheaper and more effective than phone or fax, faster than physical delivery. The internet allows groups like these all over the world to coordinate action without regard to constraints of geography and time. They can form partnerships and coalitions to operate independently. If anyone needs evidence of this, one only needs to look at the highly successful coordination via the internet of the anti-globalization protests over recent years. This is just one of the modes that has not yet been fully used by hate groups, yet the potential is certainly there. Looking towards the future a little bit and summing up, um, I think it's important to note that uh, while the Internet does indeed aid hate groups in spreading their venom, the same characteristics that work for them also contribute to the fight against racism and particularly anti-Semitism. Just as Internet allows people to unite for hate, it also allows people to unite against hate. In certain ways, it also makes it easier for researchers and law enforcement personnel to more closely track these groups.
Okay, the idea being that if these groups are out in the open and we know where they are, we know where their websites are, we're aware of what's happening. If they're hidden, we don't know. Early writings about the Internet, particularly those with a, with a neoliberal slant, tend to view the Internet not only as a marketplace for commerce, but also as a marketplace of ideas. This is also a thread in the discourse surrounding freedom of speech and expression, particularly in the United States. The attitude here is that the best way to combat hate speech is with more speech, to drown out the voices of hate and racism. While I personally do not subscribe to neoliberal ideology, I do call on those who are active in organizations, if any of them are present here, that fight hate groups to get online, to educate others to get online, and to provide them with the tools and knowledge with which to combat such, group, such groups. <laughs> Lastly, it's important to remember that technology is neutral. It's people that decide what, uh, how, and why to use technology. Thank you very much. here, uh, and now we're, we remain in the 21st century, but we're going back to a veteran medium uh, to film, and we see uh, how uh, film has fared in the uh, technological change of our period. Uh, Hillel Teist, the uh, deputy director and researcher uh, of the Steven Spielberg Jewish Film Archive here at the Hebrew University, I'm sure we can give you uh, directions uh, for whoever is interested and doesn't know it. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, the Eichmann trial uh, and ways of manipulating uh, its representation. The title is, We Have Ways of Making You Believe the Eichmann Trial. Uh, another presentation of Hills that is very uh, obvious to whoever is visiting the Hebrew University and attending this conference is between Miles Dolph and the bookstore, you will see a fascinating collection of uh, posters for uh, Jewish Zionist uh, films, uh, the handiwork of uh, Hillel and Shereya. So Hillel, please. Thank you very much, Menachem. Thank you, Jonathan, for asking me to be here today. Uh, tape's not running yet, is it? Okay. Um, before beginning, um, I don't have to mention the exhibition that's been mentioned. Interestingly enough, uh, my closing line of the paper that I'm delivering is almost identical to what Mike just said, <laughs> but you'll get to hear that in a moment. Uh, two other little things which I couldn't have known before, starting when I prepared this presentation. Um, I didn't know what Daniel Dayan was going to say in the previous session, which I found quite fascinating, uh, and I'd like to remark upon it that it would be quite appropriate if you were to look at what I am now going to show you as in some ways a continuation thematically and morally of what he had to say. In addition to which, I think there is a sense in which what I'm going to show you can be seen as a specific case study of what he was talking about. The other little point to note, um, it doesn't change anything that I'm going to say, uh, but it's simply something that's in the news that uh, on Monday night, Isser Harel passed away, the man who was probably most responsible for the operation which captured Adolf Eichmann, whose trial is the subject of my paper or one of the representations of it, uh, and without whom maybe there would have been no Eichmann trial. So I think that's a point uh, just worth bearing in mind uh, in a historical sense. So, ladies and gentlemen, in order to uh, fit this presentation into the tight time slot I have been allotted, I'm going to be concise in the extreme. I shall be summarizing, paraphrasing, and omitting much that I would prefer to back up with the direct quotes that I have at hand in explaining what you're going to see. I shall also be resorting to the briefer expedient of describing a number of scenes I would prefer to show you in order to have the time to show you in full a couple of examples that are vital to my point. The 1961 trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem was recorded in its entirety on video by producer Milton Fruchtman. Four cameras positioned in the courtroom photographed the proceedings. The director, Leo Hurwitz, determined which of those four points of view would be recorded on videotape, so that for any given moment in the trial, only one of those four viewpoints was ever recorded. 
We have at least two witnesses to this arrangement present today. The chief cameraman, Rolf Kneller, is in the audience. And um, the next speaker, Alan Rosenthal, was also a member of the production team, but I will not uh, take away his chance to introduce his connection to the trial. Uh, I was not present at the trial. I was uh, embryonic in the most literal sense of the, world, of the word. However, the man responsible for that is also here today. <laughs> After the trial, the original material and a partial set of duplicates were sent to the United States. The tapes returned to Israel in the early 1970s and were housed at what is today the Steven Spielberg Jewish Film Archive. It appears that the duplicate set was intact, though some originals were missing. These tapes were subsequently copied to the three-quarter inch format, what was then the professional standard, and were accessible for a fee, but without limit on content. Throughout the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, the archive continued to give prominence to this collection in its publicity. In the mid-1990s, as the result of a decision by then state archivist Eviatar Frizel, the state archive funded the creation of two duplicate sets to the beta digital format from the originals, two-inch video. One for use in research and production, one to remain unused for preservation purposes only. It was at that time that production of Eyal Sivan's and Ronnie Brownman's film, The Specialist, or A Specialist, as it's sometimes called, began. The Specialist is a two-hour film created entirely with the exception of one shot, you will see that shot, from the original material. I will mention for the record that the filmmakers displayed considerable hostility to the archive during the production, and Eyal Sivan in particular has perpetuated verbally and in writing a number of patent falsehoods relating to the issue. As regards the film itself, its makers have claimed that it is inspired by Hannah Arendt's controversial book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. They have admitted to considerable manipulation of the material, both digital and by conventional editing methods. Statements have included that it is a courtroom drama, that it reflects reality as seen by the filmmakers, that it wishes to give Eichmann a chance to present his own case. Sivan has asserted that, and I quote, only God knows the truth, a comment which, given its original context, I view as an attempt to deny that the original unedited record of the trial can have any more validity than the specialist. Sivan freely admits that his film reflects his viewpoint. I think it is therefore valid to share that viewpoint with you. I feel certain he would agree with me in defining himself as an anti-Zionist. I wish to be utterly clear that I am not presuming to judge Sivan for his political views. Zionism is a political movement and Sivan has as much right as anybody to be for it, against it or indifferent to it. I am only concerned with his political views in as much as he permits them to influence his attitude to the truth. Robert Wistrich, in his opening address last night, described how anti-Zionism has, in many cases, gone beyond the perfectly legitimate criticism of, and or opposition to, the policies of the State of Israel and its government, to act as a cover for something more sinister, unrelated to the policies of any particular Israeli government. How far has Sivan's anti-Zionism led him? It has led him to support calls to boycott all Israeli products, research and cultural links with Israel, and all Israeli art institutions and artists. He has denied that those in today's France who physically attack synagogues and Jewish community centers are anti-Semitic. He lays the blame on the victims of those attacks, who, by continuing to support Israel, even under Ariel Sharon, have confused those who are justly anti-Zionist. The 1947 UN vote on partition was, according to Sivan, an historic mistake and the unconditional right of return for all Palestinian refugees is a topic on whose truth he is unambiguous. How does Sivan view the Eichmann trial? He has repeatedly stated that Eichmann was utterly secondary to those who staged managed the trial, that it wasn't Eichmann's trial, but a trial in which Zionism, to which, we, as we have seen, he is opposed, tried Nazism. This last statement was made explicitly in an interview he gave in Berlin when the film was first shown there. He has suggested that one purpose of this show trial was for the Zionist Ashkenazi elite of Israel to convey the message to the Jews of Middle Eastern origin, who had been brought to Israel as a poor substitute for those lost in the Holocaust, that their oppression by the Ashkenazim was insignificant compared to what their oppressors had suffered. The memory of genocide authorizes the negation of Palestinian suffering, Sivan has claimed. The specialist which its makers admit reflects their views, as stated above, has become, since its release nearly five years ago, 
widely accepted as the definitive documentary account of the trial. Two years ago, Israel's Channel 2 broadcast it as the highlight of its Holocaust Memorial Day programming. How can one account for this acceptance? It is my belief that the majority of viewers permit what they see to confirm them in views they already hold, in addition to which the most subversive techniques employed in the film cannot be detected without comparison with the unedited original. Not everyone does accept it, of course. Gabriel Bach, who assisted Gidon Hausner in the prosecution, has commented on a specialist, I'm paraphrasing, that it was one-sided in that it chose to show Eichmann's unsuccessful defense to the almost total exclusion of the evidence that was responsible for his conviction. Before describing some scenes and showing others to you, I wish to remind you that every editing decision taken by Sivan and Brauman had two parts, what they decided to show and what they decided not to show. Every time they decided to reshape a detail of the trial to show you their conception of reality, they also decided their, that their audience would not see that detail as it originally was. Some of these decisions may seem minor to you, but even the smallest of them entailed many hours of work to conceive and execute. I therefore suggest that these so-called minor changes were of vital importance to the filmmakers. Prompting the questions, why and what do they mean? A technique employed frequently is the superimposition of a digitally generated, seemingly reflected image of a witness over a shot of Eichmann in his glass booth. This technique also masks the use of reaction shots of Eichmann from other parts of the trial, something which happens throughout. When Eichmann asks permission to exit his booth to look more closely at a map hanging behind him, the filmmakers introduce artificial tension by showing Hausner looking significant, significantly in the direction of the judges and the judge pausing before giving his assent. This moment never happened. It is a fabrication, albeit a relatively benign one. The map sequence concludes with Hausner joining Eichmann at the map. Seen together from behind, the two look remarkably similar. This visual aspect is emphasized by making the soundtrack artificially inaudible at this point. Sivan has spoken much of his focus on Eichmann, a focus he claims has been neglected. He also focuses on Hausner, trying to draw parallels between him and Eichmann. Shots of both shuffling pieces of paper, fidgeting with their fingers, are juxtaposed. I remind you once more that to find these similar shots must have taken untold hours to locate within the hundreds of hours of the trial video. The big difference is that Eichmann is shown only as a helpless prisoner in the dock, whereas Hausner is a vigorous prosecutor. I shall shortly show you how a witness attempting, attempting to convey an impression of Eichmann in his prime is dealt with. In one sequence, Eichmann answers a question put to him by Hausner. The original contains one reaction shot of Hausner, this one. In the specialist, there are two. Here they are. This is the substitution. This was the original. The difference is clear. One could minimize the significance of the substitution by saying, still, all they did was take one shot of Hausner listening to Eichmann and substitute two other ones. I wish to remind you that if there is a shot of Hausner inserted as a reaction shot to Eichmann speaking and showing him apparently dismissive of and disinterested in what Eichmann is saying, the explanation could also be that the shot was taken from a dead moment in the trial when nothing was happening and that what seems to be Hausner ignoring the question, the answer to his question, was originally Hausner with nothing to ignore. In showing you examples, I am limiting myself to two. One subtle in its technique, the other not. To begin with the unsubtle one, here is how Hausner is introduced in the film, setting the tone for the rest of his appearances. We have the first clip. Uh, we hope we have sound here. Yes, Cole? The video? Shall I be Cole? Und jetzt kann ihn 
מעשי אימים, אשר כל המעולל אותם מוחק את צלם האדם מעל פניו. כי ישנם מעשים שהם מחוץ לתחום האנושי, שהם מעבר למחיצה המפרידה בין אדם לחיה. ואני מבקש ממצא מבית המשפט הזה. כי הוא עשה מתוך להיטות רצון ותאווה עד תום. The contrast between Hausmann and Eich Hausner and Eichmann is clear. The most active elements in this montage are the music and sound effects. I could begin to argue about the fact that after Hausner's speech takes off, we are no longer able to follow it coherently, indicating how important what he had to say was to the filmmakers. But I don't think it's even necessary. If the message of this sequence isn't clear, I suggest you go and watch a good old-fashioned horror movie and observe whose entrance is backed by scary music. That's right, the villains. The vast majority of the witnesses seen in the specialist appear within a single montage sequence, taking less than five minutes of this two-hour film. I wish to show this sequence to you now and then to focus in detail on a fragment of it, less than 20 seconds in length, in order to demonstrate what can be achieved by a sufficiently competent filmmaker with an agenda, even in such a short space of time. Uh, tape two. Einige Monate vor Beginn der Deportation 
aus dem RSHA-Transport Bernstock. Transport gehen wir eh hin, wir haben eine sehr Kraft. Hagira, Tikina. Transport in die Transport in. Da. Schüter. Juden. Dann mal Leute, wo ist die Leine Schumra? Noch ein, noch ein, die Leine Schumra. Wir passen, die Leine Schumra, die Leine Schumra, die Leine Schumra, die Leine Schumra, one time my mother came up with her child and when she undressed she spit in the face of this SD man. They took the child on the legs, knocked the head against a tree and put it in the fire and hair they hanged on her feet. The other women seeing this said themselves, what for? And this happened quite a few times. Sie ist doch tot. Menschen sind wohl verrückt. Sie ist es weh. Sie wissen, wer ich bin? Ich, aber die Aktion. He said to me that Eichmann influenced Hitler. Warte, für Mut. שוב פעם, הבאתי אותו, סחבתי את האיש והבאתי אותו לקחוניות. יצרו את הכמות של אנשים, את המלא, שהספיקו בקושי לסגור את הדלת החיצונית של התא. כאשר גמרנו את העבודה והיה עוד זמן והיה קר, כפו של הזונדר קומנדו ריחם עלינו ואמרנו ילדים בחוץ קר תתחממו בתאי הגזים אין שם כרגע אף אחד צוואר מדוע לא התנגדתם? מדוע עליתם על הרכבת? מה שעברת, אתה הצלחת לשכוח? לא, אני... אני בלילות לא ישן. לא יכול לישון בלילות. רודפים אחריי תמיד. After Abba Kovner can now concludes the witness montage, the judge addresses Hausner severely about the departure from relevance to the direct issues of the trial of some of his witnesses, and Hausner is seen to unwillingly accept the dressing down. Uh, unless I have miscounted, Abba, Abba Kovner was the 33rd of the approximately 100 witnesses, and this exchange took place before most of the witnesses you have just seen had testified. The film's editing tries to make it seem as if this criticism by the judge of their relevance referred to all whom you've just seen. The next sequence shows Hausner in his most aggressive attack on the defendant, raising his voice and demanding a yes or no answer. The editing clearly suggests that having been taken to task for wasting the court's time with irrelevant witnesses, Hausner reacts by venting his spleen upon the helpless defendant. It is my contention that by fragmenting and otherwise playing with the words spoken by these witnesses and by Hausner in the previous montage, the filmmakers wish to varying degrees to trivialize, mock and misrepresent. To colloquialize the way I interpret their intentions, the message seems to be, oh, we've heard all this before. Here is the tiny detail upon which I wish to focus. Please continue to bear in mind that in the laborious task of film editing, there are no accidents or happenstance, only deliberate decisions implemented with great pains. Uh, Jonathan? And press pause. Uh, I'll tell you when to press pause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Bishop, he said to me that Eichmann influenced Hitler. Just pause for a second. Uh, Jonathan? Okay. I don't need the light again. This is going very quickly now. At the center of this part of the sequence is a man making a statement that he was told that Eichmann influenced Hitler. The witness is Judge Michael Musmano, who interrogated surviving Nazi leaders immediately after the war. Here is the unedited version of his statement. It's okay, gentlemen, it's okay. It's, I paused in me. Ribbentrop uh, if, I understand, uh, if I understood you correctly in your testimony this morning, you said that Ribbentrop had informed you that Eichmann was actually the one who pressed on Ribbentrop for the implementation of the of various of his staff. That Eichmann did what? As a press. He had certain pressure on Ribbentrop according to what urged yes. the uh, implementation <coughs> of that. He did more than that. <coughs> He said to me that Eichmann influenced Hitler. Of course, I'll be frank to say that I did not accept that because I could not conceive of anyone influencing Hitler any more than one could influence a belching volcano. אומר לכם בגלוי שלא קיבלתי דברים אלה. לא יכולתי להעלות על דעתי שיהיה מי שלא יהיה שיוכל להשפיע על היטלר, כפי שאינני מתאר שאדם כלשהו יכול היה להשפיע על הר געש פולט. נהבות. ריבנטרופ היה קרינג'ינג סיקופנט של היטלר והתחילה להתחיל אותו indicating and stating vociferously that Hitler was not in the wrong. And he regretted so much that Hitler had made the mistake of putting so much power into the hands of Adolf Eichmann. Ribbentrop was a man of the king of Hitler, and he was a man of his power on the shot of Hitler in the name of Eichmann and the king of Eichmann. Haben Sie Ribbentrop geglaubt? Haben Sie angenommen, dass das richtig ist, was er sagte? Uh, did you actually believe Ribbentrop? Did you believe that what Ribbentrop told you in this respect was true? I disbelieved him when he said that Eichmann influenced Hitler. That to me seemed nonsense. But I did believe him and there was no doubt whatsoever in my mind that Hitler had the utmost faith in Adolf Eichmann and put in his, into his hands, through Himmler, this program of the extermination of the Jewish people to which Hitler had referred in his speech in the Reichstag in 1939. Stop, Jonathan. Lights for one moment. We're cutting to the chase very in a, in a second. The point here, um, Sivan and Brauman provide a far-fetched statement made with authority, omitting the immediate denial of its plausibility by the same speaker. Interestingly enough, this moment is in Hannah Arendt's book, which inspired them, and I quote, Mr. Musmano had sat on the trials of the administrators of the concentration camps and of the members of the mobile killing units in the East. And while Eichmann's name had come up in the proceedings, he had mentioned only once in his judgments. He had, however, interviewed the Nuremberg defendants in their prison. And there, Ribbentrop had told him that Hitler would have been all right if he had not fallen under Eichmann's influence. Well, Mr. Musmano did not believe all he was told, but he did believe that Eichmann had been given his commission by Hitler himself and that his power came by speaking through Himmler and Heydrich. Um, 
Sivan does not follow Arendt, but it's very close to something which I don't have time to read you. It's almost identical in the justi findings for justification in the David Irving case. Did almost exactly the same thing as Sivan did. The very end of this, the man, and this is unomittable, but it's very, very short. The man between whose appearances Musmano is sandwiched is Joel Brand. Let's look at that moment again. Okay. He said to me that Eichmann influenced Hitler. I'll pause here. Pause there, please. Uh, I submit that this tiny extract has about an air of grotesque jollity. I wish to pause for a moment here to allow you to see the last frame the filmmakers use before they cut away from Brand. The last image the viewer has before the cut is what seems to be the satisfaction of someone who has just been entertaining, an impression heightened by the fact that the edit also cuts off the beginning of what promises to be a loud burst of laughter in the courtroom. Let's view this one last time. Are we playing, Jonathan? Um, I would hope so. Just a moment. Okay. He said to me that Eichmann influenced Hitler. And now here's the unedited original Brand is telling of a personal encounter with Eichmann. President of court, you youngsters there in the court, please keep quiet. Uh, there was an anteroom and a room, and the table separated the anteroom from the room, and I reached as far as the table. Uh, Eichmann was standing there in front of the table uh, with his arms akimbo and and he bawled at me if I may say he barked out do you know who I am? Uh, I am in charge of the operation. Europa, Poland, Czechoslovakia, in Österreich, durchgeführt. Jetzt den die Ungarn an die Reihe kommen. Bei Europa, bei Polen, bei Czechoslovakia. In Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, you know what happened, and now came the turn of uh, Hungary. What action did he mean, Mr. Brandt? Ich wusste welche Aktion. He said action. I knew what action he had in mind. He used the word action or operation. That he uh, he further added uh, that he had my case examined through the intermediary of the... Uh, he examined my case as a man of the joint and the Suchnut, and he said that I am a man still capable of some output. This was the word he used. What else did he say to you? He was ready to sell a million you can cut there, Jonathan. My last words. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are dealing with filmmakers whose agenda is sufficiently important to them that they have not shrunk from adding laughter to the soundtrack of Testament in the Eichmann trial. 
I do not believe that I am either lucky enough or clever enough to have accidentally found the only such instances of this type of manipulation in the film and assume that a systematic comparison would reveal it at work throughout. I wish to end on a direct quote from A.L. Sivan spoken in New Delhi at an event entitled Experiments in Truth in May 2001. There is no moral value to be linked to a technique itself, but only to its use can it be judged. Ladies and gentlemen, for the time being, I rest my case. so much uh, over the past few years that we won't get into the details. His background is in law and in communication at Stanford University. Uh, Alan has both produced, uh, practiced what he preaches in the communication department, produced, written, uh, and lectures brilliantly, and we'll just get a little uh, example uh, of that uh, in a short response to In David Lodge's novel, A Small World, there's a guy who has to give a talk at a conference. And he hasn't written the talk. And the conference moves from Rome to London to Paris, and he's still wondering what to do. And it comes right to the end. He hasn't written anything except the opening statement, and suddenly there's a terrorist attack. He doesn't have to give his talk. When, when you come to the end of a day like this, which was supposed to finish half an hour ago, the temptation is just to say, I'll tell you a joke, that's it, goodbye. No. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to actually tell you some more, but I'm going to put aside all the notes that I had. As Hillel mentioned, I worked at the Eichmann trial, and I worked with Rolf Kneller here. It was a pleasure, the five months working with him, and a pleasure to see him again. Besides that, I've dealt with Eichmann over the years. I did the first transcript transfers of the two-inch tape to quarter-inch. And later on, I did a film for the Jewish Museum on the Eichmann trial. And very recently, last year, I did a film with Nissim Mossek on Eichmann's secret diaries. So I have an enduring interest with Eichmann. A couple of months ago, I was asked by Film Quarterly to write a review of The Specialist. And I said, why? And he said, well, this is a fantastic film. It's the greatest film on Eichmann and the Holocaust and so on. And I said, you must be out of your mind. And I proceeded to explain why. There have been various deliberate anti-Semitic films in the past. You're familiar with Jew Sus. You're familiar with The Eternal Jew of Fritz Hippler. These are films noted for their anti-Semitism. The audience knows it. The SS that received the Eternal Jew knew exactly where it was coming from. Here I think we have something much more grave. We have a film which purports to give an overview of the Eichmann trial, a picture of Eichmann, and to the innocent, which is probably 90% of the viewers, that's, this is, as Hillel said, this is the story. And it is so distorted, it is so untrue, that I get angry just thinking about it. He's done, Sivan, an amazing thing to take a trial which was supposed to show the world what happened during the Holocaust, what Eichmann was like, and reverse it 180 degrees. What I was going to say after that, I'm going to throw away. There are just three or four points that seem to me worthwhile making. First of all, I think a filmmaker has to be, when he's dealing, or she's dealing, with history. You try to be objective. You try to be up to date with the latest historical information. You try not to be ideological, you try to be fair, you can't be objective. And I think Sivan meets none of this criteria. If we just take the trial itself, Hillel showed you what went wrong with the actual editing. Let me deal more with what is absent from the film. 
There's a total misconception of Hausner. There is no sense of the audience. There's no sense of the judges. There's no sense of the deputy prosecutors in the film. Wannsee, which is very, very important, is given a throwaway treatment in the film. There is no sense of Eichmann's deceit. There's no sense of Eichmann's organization. Uh, and one can go on. The filmmaker, and it's something Hillel didn't mention, takes a tremendous amount of time dealing with the Judenrat, which Hannah Arendt, of course, does in her book as well, showing that here the Judenrat were assisting the Nazis to send the Jews to the camps. And it goes on and on, and it takes a major part of the film. The sense of the resistance, which was vital to the trial, which came out and lingers in the mind of anybody of the trial, was missing. We saw Abba Kovna. We saw him for about 10 seconds. This is what Abba Kovna actually said. The ghetto fighters were working against incredible odds. You must understand this. You must understand the unimaginable conditions to set up a fighting organization when the people are not yet aware their fate is sealed, to tear down their divisions, to organize when there's no central authority. When you're paralyzed, terrorized, there's no easy task. And when you're surrounded by three walls of enemies, the Germans, the Ukrainian killers, and the local populations. What can you do? The witnesses who actually confront Eichmann and who see Eichmann are almost totally missing from Sivan's film. I went through some of their statements. Moritz Fleischmann from Austria. He addressed us in harsh language, the like of which I've never seen before. He warned us not to approach. Obviously, we would have to, he would, if we approached, he would deal with us in another time. Franz Meyer from Austria describes something vital again missing. He describes the Eichmann system. What was Eichmann doing? This is the system as described by Meyer. He built the Eichmann system, his smooth, efficient, immigration assembly line. You put in a Jew at one end, and he passes through the building, and as he passes through the building, he's stripped of everything so that when he comes out, he has no house, no money, only a passport, and a visa to leave immediately. There's another witness who confronted Eichmann, who we see passing for two seconds, Dean Gruber. Dean Gruber said of him, My impression, he was like an iceberg, a block of ice, what we call a mercenary trooper. The mercenary who, when he doffs his uniform, doffs his conscience and his reason. So one can go on with the things which are missing from the actual trial. But besides being a picture of a trial, this is a picture of Eichmann. And I think any serious scholar, filmmaker today would have gone a little bit deeper. They might have used some comments of Hess on Eichmann, or Vicente. Now Hess, who was the commandant of Auschwitz, wrote a memoir. Now I agree it's a suspect memoir when he was about to come on trial. But Hess mentions in his memoir something like this. When I was in doubt, I thought of Eichmann. When I was trying to push the children into the gas chambers and my knees were buckling, I would think of Eichmann who said to me, You've got to do it, because if we don't win this battle now, this battle will come down to the future generation. More seriously, Sivan talked of Eichmann being a witness, of the things that he said. We hardly hear Eichmann in the film. But Eichmann did leave a witness, and I'm not talking about the memoirs which were released last year. Those were memoirs written when he's facing the judge, when he wanted to save himself, the memoirs which put down continuously, I was a cog, 
I did nothing, I did this. But he wrote another set of memoirs. In 1956-57, when he was free in Argentina, he sat down for six months with a Dutch fascist journalist who had actually belonged to the SS, called William Sasson. And over wine and beer, he dictated 66 tapes of his memoirs. Now, those memoirs were never used in the trial, only a few pages of them where he had the transcripts marked by Eichmann. The judges refused to accept transcripts without the tapes, and Hausner couldn't get hold of the tapes, or he could only get hold of the tapes if he couldn't use them at the trial. Those memoirs to Sassen, which appeared fractionally in Life magazine, and in a French magazine, were then forgotten, seemed to me to give the best record of Eichmann. And I'll just read you a few of the notes from Sassen. On Hungary, the idea of the blood for goods. Such an idea, swapping trucks for people, never crossed my mind. I always prefer to see the enemy dead than alive. In the Sassen Memoirs, he mentioned how nobody could escape. And that's a point, again, not brought out by Sivan. If you go through the trial and through the memoirs, you see that Eichmann let nobody go. When the partisans in Yugoslavia, he gave the command for them to be shot. He gave the command for children to go, for the trains to move in France. When the German government itself wanted to free a few Dutch industrialists, Jewish industrialists, he said, no, we cannot set the example. In Hungary, he came into Hungary with his own Eichmann commando. He said, and he says, now the master has come to finish the job. In Hungary, Horty, who was the regent, was getting worried, and he gave orders for the trains to stop. Eichmann had sent a train from Gestarts camp to the border. Horty gave an order for the train to stop, it came back. Eichmann went in again and made sure that train went. In Hungary, in two months, he managed to kill or send to the gas chambers almost half a million Jews. On the question of deceit, I interviewed a guy called Zev Sapir for the film I made last year. Zev Sapir appeared at the trial. This is what he said on a meeting with Eichmann, which illustrates the deceit, which I do not remember seeing in Sivan's film. Sapir. Suddenly Eichmann appeared. We saw him. He appeared very strong, dressed in a green SS uniform. Other officers formed a half circle around him. And he began to give a speech. We saw him. I'm sorry. And he began to give a speech, to talk. Unbelievably in Yiddish. He knew it perfectly. And he said, Dear Jews, you're going to a place, a very beautiful and nice place. The children, your children, will learn at school. And you will work during the day, and at night you'll return. It will be all fine and good. And you'll have a complete and happy family life. One more example of deceit. He went into Greece with this licensee, and he told the Greeks, look, it's a wonderful place, it's called Auschwitz, but you can only go there if you're married. Sign up, get married quickly, things will be fine. And that's what the Greek Jews of Thessalonica believed. I'll give you, because of time, just the last comment. We see Eichmann in Sivan's film. The perpetrator has become a victim. Hausner has become the perpetrator. In the end, people left after Sivan's film, almost poor Eichmann. What was he like? I'll just give you that in his own words. Because it seems to me 
The things he said to Sassen absolutely sum him up. When he appeared at the trial, he consistently tried to say, I was a cog, I did nothing. But when he spoke to Sassen, this is what I imagine. I, at least I imagine he said what he really believed. And this is what he said. Sassen asked him, are you sorry? And he said, yes. I'm sorry for one thing that I wasn't hard enough and I wasn't tough enough, that I didn't fight these damn interventionists enough. And now you see the result, the creation of the State of Israel and the reemergence of the race. That to me is the real Eichmann. And with great regrets, I will close the session at this point. Uh, I'm sure each and every one of the presenters is available for, to uh, address comments and answer questions further in the conference uh, and on other occasions. But since uh, we have to move on to the Cinematic, I, 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 with many apologies, I close here. Thank you all for attending this fascinating session. And uh, I want to thank our presenters all five of them. Thank you very much.